Hello everybody, this is Michael Hollands once again for Sound of the Movies. Today I have the pleasure to once again be joined by Terence Blanchard. On this episode, we will focus on The Five Bloods, his latest collaboration with director Spike Lee, which is now available on Netflix, and Perry Mason, the most recent HBO series. It is my pleasure to welcome back Terence Blanchard. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your schedule, Terence. And at first, I would like to talk about Spike Lee. Um, you have been working with him for 30 years now. Yeah. I think on a total of 18 movies, if I didn't miscount. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, have, I haven't counted, so I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just under 20. Um, Your first movie together was um, Jungle Fever. That was the first big project which you worked on together. And how would you describe the evolution of music in Spike Lee's films? Well, I think, you know, both of us just have grown as artists. I remember back then, you know, I was scared to death scoring films, trying to learn as much as I could about the movie business. Um, but over the years... You know, he's just helped me grow by putting out great movies, man. I mean, you know, every time I would get a film from him, I would be like, oh, my God, okay, can't be the weak link in this chain, you know, because I, I would see that he would step up his game with every film. Oh, yes. I mean, he has directed tremendous films. But how and when did Spike pitch you this project, The Five Bloods? You know, when he pitched me to Five Bloods, man, was right after we were doing, a, it was not after, it was during all of the Oscar runs from last year. You know, we were at, I think we were at the Oscars, actually. He says to me, hey, man, I'm getting ready to start my next flick. I'm like, what? I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm like, dude, shouldn't you take a break, you know? And uh, he told me, he was, I forgot where they shot, but he told me he was getting ready to leave the country to go shoot the next film. And I went, okay. Well, I'll, I'll see you when you get back. Yes, I mean, you were nominated for um, the Black Black um, Klansman. Yeah. Uh -huh. Which was another big film of his. Great directing again by, by Spike Lee. And you wrote a marvelous score, which got you, you, for which you received your very first Academy Award nomination. It was a great experience, man. I had a, I had a lot of fun. You know, I was hanging out with Mark Shaman and Nick Bertel. And uh, at all of the events, and you know, we had a great time. Oh, I bet. I mean, you were in great company: Nicholas Pretel, Mark Shaman, two great artists. So, the experience itself is what counts. I be I believe. Oh yeah. I mean, listen. You know, I never looked for a nomination or anything like that. It, it's, it's it's not the reason why we do what we do, but the the, the recognition is always uh, a, a humbling honor for sure. Uh, so when it came, you know, I was overwhelmed by the entire thing and just happy to be a part of the process. Let's talk about um, The Five Plots a little bit more. And I have just rewatched it again yesterday. I've watched it twice now, and I must say it's a very p powerful movie. Would you consider this one one of your most personal projects so far, artistically and also musically speaking? I mean, I guess so. I mean, when he's talking about personal, I mean... When the Leverage Broke is one that's kind of hard to top because, you know, we were actually living that saga at the time. But, you know, this is probably one of the most emotional, for sure. It's a hard thing to acknowledge the amount of sacrifice that these African-American soldiers gave during the war only to come back home and not given a hero's welcome and actually were fighting for rights that they didn't have at home. That uh saddens me greatly you know and given what we're experiencing here in the u.s right now it's even more disheartening to to see that we haven't moved the needle in terms of race relations as far as we thought we had so in that regard i'm, I'm amazed at the level of professionalism that those guys exhibited you know in the face of all of that they still did their jobs they still did it to the highest level of integrity possible and you have to you know take your hat off to them for that given the ultimate sacrifice 
Yes, absolutely. And I believe we we talked about um, a similar <clears throat> issue when we spoke about um, black black landsmen and all the the racial prejudice and and everything that that goes on in 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 this world. And I I sincerely hope that one day we we will be able to overcome this it's such an emotional subject matter and very difficult to boot it is but you know the, the the beautiful thing about what's been happening here in the u.s is that george floyd's death has been a wake-up call for a lot of people who just didn't want to realize the truth about what was happening to african americans and people of color in this country you know at the hands of the police you know when people saw that firsthand and saw this guy look like he enjoyed killing him, most people equated it to a modern day lynching. And I think that revelation has allowed people to, to get up off the sidelines because, you know, uh, one of the things that we always say is complacency is the enemy of change, you know, and silence is the thing that allows these things to happen. So now you have people who are not African American, who are not persons of color coming out and speaking about these issues. And it's making a difference, you know. I'm here to tell you, it's happening in all facets of life here in the U.S. right now. Now, I don't know how far it's gonna go, you know, but right now, people are waking up to their own tacit approval of uh, this racist system that has oppressed so many people over the decades when working on a project with this great director and when working on a movie such as the five plots i believe it's a big motivation also for you which you can also benefit from you know when you explore serious themes and issues and spike has said in the past that he wants to have a certain cinematic sound and he seems to be aware of how much depth the score can bring to his vision or can add to his vision as a filmmaker. Um, how did he describe what he wanted to hear in this particular case, Terrence? Well, we don't, we don't really have those conversations anymore like that. The thing that he'll, <laughs> one of the things that he'll say to me next time, he said, all right, it's time for you to take us to the next level. And I know what that means. You know, we've been working together for a number of years. I know what it is that he likes, what he doesn't like. He likes to have strong melodic content. He wants to have reoccurring themes. You know, he wants people to walk out of the theater with the themes on their mind. He wants you to have that visceral reaction every time you hear the melody being played someplace, you know, and he wants you to make that connection to the story. I understand that, and he gives me a lot of room to create that. So, you know, I take on the challenge of just trying to make sure that I never disappoint this guy you know, for having so much trust and giving me so much room. And at the same time, he gives me something great to work with. You know, that's that's the most important thing. He puts it all on the screen. There's not the there's not much for us to talk about because it's right there in the in the story. You know, when you look at Delroy Lindo's performance, Clark Peters, you know, Whitlock and all of these other guys, man, their performances are amazing. And, you know, when it came time for me to score this film, I just tried to follow their lead and tried to really help accentuate what they were doing on screen. Yes, very well put. And especially Delroy Lindo, uh, yeah. his, tr his performance was um, incredible. And I must say, it's an Academy Award performance for me personally. I mean, that that, that was, I mean, everybody did a very good job on this film. The, yeah. act, the acting was just really, yeah. really good. And they walked... A, a line between triumph and hope and of course you had to balance that musically which I think you did very well too thank you well yeah I mean there there is that balance and the thing about a Spike Lee film you know you it will it will run the gamut of emotions you know you will have the drama you will have the comedy you'll have a lot of different aspects of, of just daily life and the, the wonderful thing about it is, is that he has actors that have such range, that are such great actors. You know, it makes my job so much easier because there's no need for me to push really hard because, you know, those guys are covering it. You know, when there's, there's certain scenes, 
the assassination of Martin Luther King, you know, uh, is one thing. You go from that emotion all the way up to the comedic part where they're asking for the bug spray in the middle of the night. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to witness. When I was sitting down working on this film, I was just totally amazed at the artistry of everyone involved, even the cinematography, man. The, the colors, the way the film looks is just, it's just gorgeous. It's stunning. Oh, yes. The cinematography was very good. I mean, that, that was mm -hmm. uh, Newton Thomas uh, Siegel, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought it was also a pretty nice idea to change the aspect ratio in, during the, during the um, the course of the film, and which you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. signifies the um, difference or em or puts emphasis on which moment in time we we are yeah. at, at this at this moment. Yeah, whether we're on flashback or whether we're in present day. I must say the story is also about friendship as much as it is about about loss. I mean, there are five characters. One of them, the squad leader, unfortunately, you know, passed. And also Delroy Lindo's character seems to have a very hard time coping, coping with that. And there are several strong scenes in the movie or also scenes which um, are about love. And especially also during the um, the dinner scene um, in the first act of the movie, and I noticed he also used the um, duduk to a great extent, which was an, an especially nice touch. Which you say this was the best instrument to um, to express and sort of friendship and love. Well, I, I think it was we, in, in a sense. I mean, you know, I, I, it was the closest thing that I could find to use to give us a flavor of. Of, of being in Vietnam. I, I wish I had more instruments, but, you know, um, I thought the Duke was a beautiful sound. And the more and more I got into it, I kept saying, I don't need other instruments. Let's just deal with this because uh, Pedro, who was the guy who played the, the, the Duke, had such a beautiful sound and beautiful tone yes. that, that it became It, it, it took on a life of its own, you know, in the film. And I felt like there was nothing else to add to it. And it, it goes back to the thing, you know, the old jazz musicians always used to say, less is more. Were you, to a certain degree, influenced by footage which Spike sent you first? Or did he ask you to just to just write based, or based uh, on your instincts? Oh, no, no, no. I was, man, no, the footage, the footage. You know, when when I when I got this, you know, uh, in my studio, the first thing I thought of was like, oh my god, this dude is something else, man. I, you know, and I called him up. I said, damn, bro, that's all I told him, <laughs> yeah. because I thought it was just amazing, you know. And I had to have time to sit down and digest. It's it's an I think it's an incredible film. Yes, absolutely. One of the strongest ones of 2020, I must say, also for, for me personally. And I also think um, that your score also stands as one of this year's finest. And um, thank you. Thank no, you. No, I really, I really mean that. It's a, it's a very good, very good score. And could you please walk me through a theme development for for the characters and how you found the the arc and the musical soul for the um for the characters and the blood so to speak well one of the things that i've had to learn with spike is that never try to anticipate what a theme is going to be used for so i've gotten to the point now i try to just create themes that I feel are emotionally connected to the story. Uh, because what will happen is I'll give Spike like five or six ideas. And when he gets them, you know, he'll be like, oh, okay, I want to use this for this and this. For and inevitably he never picks, he never, I mean, never picks what I think would have been the main melody. Right. And it always poses a challenge to me to figure out, okay, well, how am I going to turn this into what, what we need? For example, I'll give an example. When we did Inside Man, you know, I gave him this theme that I thought should be the love theme, 
and I performed it with just a flute sound and acoustic piano. And then he took that and you wanted that to be the main thing. So then I had to figure out how to take this love theme and make it menacing. That's a very that's a very good way to um, way to to approach it. And of course, I believe it keeps it keeps you on your toes and work and work and never gets gets boring when you're around Spike Lee. <laughs> no, no, it never gets boring. But it also makes you learn a lot about orchestration. <laughs> That's for sure. And speaking of orchestration or of orchestras, I mean, many composers have sets in the past and also sets um, to me that the the most wonderful moment for them takes place when the score comes to life yeah. during the live performance and recording of the score. How did you feel in this particular case, walking into the recording facility? Well, that, that, that has become my moment. You know, it's, 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 it's always so interesting. You know, it's also Spike's moment too, but for different reasons. He, he's just, he's, he's experiencing the music for the first time because he doesn't hear any demos after we pick the teams. He waits until he gets to the studio. But for me, you know, it, it, there is that thing that you can't really describe where the music becomes a living, breathing thing. And all of these souls in one room, if when they get it, it's an awesome feeling because the music will go, will, will go way beyond what you perceived it to be, you know? because there's those little inflections that you couldn't have accounted for, those little turns of phrases that people do, even though they're reading the music. And I think that is the part, that, that is the portion of it that I love the most, is to sit back and hear something and go, oh, wow, I get it. But I didn't see it coming to that degree, I guess is what I should say. And I'm glad it all worked out wonderfully at the end. And that's the the hard labor uh, paid off. I'm sure there are certain scenes in the film which posed an, an enormous challenge for you as a, as a composer. Oh, yeah. I mean, first of all, the movie itself is just a phenomenal movie. But the opening sequence, the battle scene, was a challenge to keep, you know, things moving. Because like I said, you know, Spike likes melodic music. So it's not like I'm scoring the action per se in that battle sequence. The music is, is basically making commentary on it more than anything else. So it, it's, it's an interesting thing with Spike, you know, because I went through this when we did uh, Miracle at St. Anna, that battle scene, I scored the scene, you know, I, I, like, like with action drums and all kinds of brass and And Spike was like, no, 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 no. That was one of the one scenes in our entire career that I had to rewrite, you know. He says, no, man. He says, I want to hear the melody. I want you to go counter to what's on screen, you know. And I remember that when it came time to do this. Uh, but trying to keep the energy flowing with that was a, was, was a task. I bet it was. And I'm glad um, Spike Lee feels that way about, about music and that he recognizes music as a strong element which needs to accompany the film which certainly isn't a given in this day and age um i'm sure you know what i mean i mean there are oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> quite yeah. a uh, there seem to be quite a few filmmakers that are not too keen on having melodies or strong melodies and um right. it's 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 changed quite a bit but thankfully we still have directors out there who do not underestimate the power of music well yeah and i think you know with spike what's really beautiful about it is that he challenges you as he challenges you as a composer you know to because you know the composer me still wants to service the story and service the film you know so you have to learn how to combine all of these elements together. And over the years, you know, since we've been doing it for a while now, I mean, I think that's one of the things that has grown between the two of us is just learning how to go deeper uh, into the skill set that we started with, you know? Um, yes. Because when I watched The Five Bloods, man, the choices that he made in terms of editing, you know, shot angles all of that stuff I, i thought it was just 
amazing. And it's funny because it just flowed effortlessly and people don't realize how hard it is to do that, you know, to keep your eye moving, to keep you engaged in the story along with great performances from an actor. It's, it's, it's a true collaborative process that can fall flat on its face at any given time. And the beautiful thing about Spike, he's like a, he's like a great coach in terms of keeping everybody motivated and on track. Yeah, that's very well put. I mean, I'm, I'm sure many people um, don't necessarily realize how big an effort it is to, to shoot a movie and to write music and to put everything together. And it's hard to establish a certain continuity to make sure every, everything runs smoothly. Everybody needs to pitch in and make sure that you have a, how do I put this, a well-oiled machine, so to speak. To yep. make, yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. You know, you know, the thing that I likened it to is like, take, just think about when you make your family videos on the holidays, right? Yeah. Trying to, trying to cover everything. And the beautiful thing about what great filmmakers are, are adept at doing is that just when your brain says, I would like to see, they cut to whatever that is. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and that's the seamless part that I'm talking about. It's like they are a step ahead of you in the story process. Terrence, if we still have a couple of minutes left, I would like to talk about uh, Perry Mason. Oh, yeah. You scored the first season of the new HBO series Perry Mason. And if I am informed correctly, the full score will be released as soon as se the complete season one has aired on HBO and every or after every episode new score cues will be released and yes. for those of you who don't know Perry Mason tells the story of a criminal defense lawyer called Perry Mason it had at first appeared on TV I think in the late 1950s and afterwards several TV movies had been released in the 1980s and also in the 1990s and now HBO brings back the character and Terence what are your thoughts on Perry Mason the character and the show's presentation of the past including the music well I've been telling people this is not your dad's Perry Mason <laughs> this is this is this is a little this is this story here man it's it's a beautiful story um it's a it's It's a beautiful journey, I should say. That's I, I think it's more that's more apropos because Perry Mason starts out in the series as a private investigator and throughout everything that he's experiencing winds up becoming a lawyer. It is a beautiful thing to experience and it was a great opportunity to work on something that I just think is totally amazing. You know, that's another piece of art where the look of it is also amazing. You know, I, I always get excited about this because when I'm working on films or TV shows, I don't get, you know, I may get a final cut, like everything's cut, but there's not, the colors have, haven't been finalized, you know? And there's a process called color timing where they go through the film and they adjust all of the colors. And man, when I look at it, it's like certain things pop off the screen and it's just, It was just amazing. We watched the first episode uh, together as a family, and I was amazed watching it. Not already worked <laughs> worked on the thing, but it was it's an incredible story. I believe the majority of the first season was directed by Tim Van Patten, right? Yes. Right. How did you discuss the show's content, and as more importantly? How did you bring back the L.A. of the 1930s? Well, you know, it was something that, you know, when, when, when I had a conversation with Tim, one of the things, you know, we talked about and he expressed was not necessarily needing to go period with the music. You know, we wanted to do something that was fresh. And I kept saying, you know, well, I think there's a way to do something fresh and bring some of the elements from the period and use them in different ways. So that's why we have the jazz band with the saxophone section. We have a string quartet, you know, and then I'm playing on it as well. But I didn't try to think of music 
from the 50s or the 30s, actually, when this thing is set. I try to use those like any other composer would use them. If you needed a, a bit of this color here, I'll use the saxophones here. If I needed something else, I could use the strings. I, I think, you know, what we what we accomplished is that mixture between setting you in the period, but also allowing it to feel current. So it wasn't necessarily an homage to the film noir genre, right? We didn't talk about it in, the, in that term, in those terms, and maybe you know we didn't have to because one of the things I've been telling Tim, just like I was talking about with Spike, I said, "Dude, it's all there on the screen." You know, he was giving me a compliment about the music, and I said, "Well, I said I'm just following your direction," you know, because it's 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 like the 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 show tells me what it needs. You know, you just have to learn how to listen, but it's it's all right there though. You know, and that, that's a testament to Tim's um, uh, directing style and editing and how they, again, going back to that, how these people cut these things together to have a flow but still be intriguing. You know, Perry Mason, as you'll see with the, uh, with the, with the following episodes, man, it is a serious journey. And uh, I hope a lot of people get to experience it because I'm not saying this because I worked on it, man, but I told Tim, You know, I was very thankful to have the opportunity to work on something so great. I am looking forward to watching the whole series, and I'm sure the other episodes will be just as just as good. At least I hope. <laughs> oh no, man! Look, let me just let me just tell you this: the first episode is just the tip of the iceberg. Okay, great. And you, and you can't you can't even judge the series by what you saw in the first episode. No. That's just. Of course. Yeah. I, I, I was yeah. just I was just kidding, you know. <laughs> no, no, of course. No, no, I know, I know. But I'm just I'm trying not to give it away, but trust me, man, it's it's a it's a hell of a journey. I also noticed you used the um the trumpet very effectively in, in especially in two cues which have now been uh, which or which have been released so far. And for the end credits, you also incorporated electronics very uh, very effectively. And I think the score might give people an idea or a younger audience an idea as to how effective jazz elements actually can be. Well, that's, that was part of the thing. You know, I didn't want people to look at the music as just being this relic that, that lives in a museum. If you're creative enough and you allow yourself to be open to other ideas, man, there's so many other possibilities that are standing right there. They're, 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 they're sitting right at your feet. You just got to, open your eyes to see them. But sometimes when it comes to jazz, people have this thing of respecting the music so much that they that they forget to do the basic thing that the music has always done, which is to break the rules. Terence, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on Perry Mason as well. Is there anything else you would like to add? No, I mean, you know, I'd like to tell people, just be safe, man. I know these are crazy times that we're living in. You know, but we're going to get through this, you know, as a community. I, I think one of the good things that has come out of this is that it's brought us all together and made us realize more and more what's really important, family and friends in our communities. I mean, so just all be safe and we'll, we'll, we'll get, to, get together soon. I'll be over there and playing concerts pretty soon. Right. Looking forward to it. And yes, you are right. It is a time that makes us want to get closer to our friends family and to realize we should never ever take anything for for granted and we need to focus on the the positive things in in our life and yes terence i would like to yeah. thank you for, for taking so much time out of your schedule again it was a joy to have you thank as a you. guest to have you as a guest on my show again and i hope we get to chat again in the future Yeah, no, it's always good talking to you, man. So I appreciate it. Thank great, you. Great, great. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a good time and stay safe and healthy. You too, man. Bye. Take care.